Hello. Thank you for joining our talk. Um, I'm Shuman Roy, and I have with me my friend and colleague, Will Davis. We work at the New York Times, and today we would like to tell you about a really fun project that we worked on at the Times. It's hard to imagine journalism and indeed life without images. Photographs didn't appear in the Times until the late 1800s. And obviously they've been an integral part of our journalism ever since. Over the last hundred plus years, the Times has built up a large archive of physical photos. This archive has significant historical value. It serves as a visual record of the entire 20th century of life in this country and indeed beyond it. Some of these photos can be found nowhere else in the world. In 2018, we began a project to digitize these images in order to preserve them and make the archive more easily searchable and researchable. In this talk, we will review how we did that. We'll dive into challenges with off-the-shelf machine learning tools for image and text recognition. We'll also tell you how we repurposed analog metadata for a digital search experience. So the first question, where do we keep these photos? The answer is in a basement, three floors underground, next to the New York Times headquarters, just a block away from Times Square, in hundreds of steel filing cabinets. For more than a century, librarians organized millions of prints of photos into folders based on their subject and who was pictured. This collection is effective, uh, affectionately known as the morgue. As you can tell, journalists have a pretty morbid sense of humor. It is a 600,000 pound archive of photos, newspaper clippings, encyclopedias and books. In fact, it's so heavy that the flooring had to be specially made to support the weight. Let's now watch a clip where Jeff Roth, researcher and archive caretaker, describes the morgue and what is in it. First New York City subway in 1904. And there you have it. morgue is what makes the times the times. There's 600 cabinets, a few thousand drawers, six to eight million photographs dating from the late 1800s on till the 1990s. This is the Flying Hunters. This ran in 1930. George Washington Bridge, France's biggest naval ship, American soldier, greeting his mom, Christmas at Penn Station. I mean, there's pretty much anything and everything the history of the world through the eyes of the New York Times. Again, that was Jeff Roth, researcher and archive take, ter, caretaker for the New York Times. So one question we get is, why did we do this now? Um, and, and the reason is most of the material in the archive is, is not available on the internet and much of it is not available anywhere else. So it remains a valuable resource for storytelling and reporting. A recent example of this is the coverage on, on Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, and we'll see more on that later. But uh, a trip to the archive is going to run you a minimum of 30 minutes. And that is if you know exactly what you're looking for and if you have access to the office. More likely, it'll take you hours to find what you're looking for. So as valuable a resource as it is, it is expensive to use. And of course, there's a risk of losing the archive. Some of you may remember in, in 2018, there was a fire in the National Museum in Rio in Brazil, and they lost much of their archive. Um, and we had our own scare too. We had a burst pipe uh, over a weekend, and luckily someone was in there doing research on that day and the damage was minimal. And the other thing was uh, in 2018, a lot of technology around image recognition and, and text recognition were really becoming widely available across a, a lot of different providers. So we felt that the technology was also at the right point to really help us do this. 
so at this point you're asking yourself how do how does one navigate the archive and how does one find photos in the archive the answer is the index card catalog so here is an index card of uh, William Veek, who is a MLB franchise owner. And this was the only way to research the archive. So it's, some of you may remember, this is similar to the Dewey Decimal System of Libraries. You, you look up the topic and then that, and the card tells you where the, the subject is located. So we have 850,000 index cards, you know, from acapella all the way to ZZ Top. And you come here, you look at what you're looking for, you find the folder number, which, is, which are the numbers on the right, and then you go locate the folder and, and look for your photos. So let's walk through an example. Let's say you're doing a story on professional dog walkers in New York City. And maybe you happen to know that Jim Buck, the professional, the original dog walker in New York City. So you go to the card catalog, you, you thumb, you thumb your way to the card for Jim Buck and you locate that, oh, we might have some stuff about Jim Buck in folder 4645-L-40. Odds are though, you started in the animal section. You made your way to dogs and then you found pets, pet shows and miscellaneous and then you found something that might be worth looking into. So, okay, so things are telling you to go into 4645-L-40. So you go find that folder in one of the drawers and you see, okay, there's a lot of photos in here. Let's see what's in there. You open it and there you have Jim Buck in the flesh. And it's a good picture. And, and you're like, oh, I wanna use this. This is, this is a nice photo. You ask yourself, do I have the right to use this photo? I should mention that even, you know, a lot of the photos that we have, it's not clear if we actually have the runs to, to reprint it or to run it again. So you flip over the photo and whoa, there's a lot of information there, including the original caption. In this case, the Times does have the right to this photo. And in fact, we did a story recently about Jim Buck, but you can see the challenge. The challenge is you have to extract all of this information from the cards, the folder, the, the front and backs of photos and organize that content in a way so you can find what you're looking for. And let's face it, what you're not looking for. This had to be a system that promoted serendipity and browsability. So where do we start? What's step zero? Well, as you can imagine, step zero is really scanning these images. When we started the project, we were fortunate that the index cards had already been scanned. So as, as soon as we ingested those cards in, we had a starting point. People could still, people could already start using the system before we had scanned all the photos. So that's step zero is the scanning. We had a team of scanners uh, meticulously bring up drawers of, of folders and scan the front and back and feed it into the system that we're building. What's next? Well, somewhere around step 50, you wind up with an architecture that looks a lot like this. And obviously there were lots of twists and turns and, and things you know, we kept and we didn't keep, but obviously no time to get through all of that. So today we'll focus on the image analysis part, in particular OCR and card to folder mapping. And Will will take you through the next section. Thanks, Shimon. <clears throat> so to start, um, modern images come with a lot of metadata. The, that metadata is provided by cameras and by the photographers themselves. And so this is an example of an image that was sent to us recently. And you can see, for example, the date that the image was taken that's provided by the camera. Um, you can see when the image was sent to us originally, the photographer provided their name and a caption, a description of that image. And so, uh, and oftentimes there's even location information from the camera. So we know by just by looking at the metadata of this image that this is Skafagas in, uh, in Iceland and that it was taken by uh, Vera for the New York Times that we own the rights to this image. So none of our scans did not have any of that information embedded. All we had was the information from the time of scanning, which was basically useless. So as Shimon mentioned, um, one of the reasons why it made sense to do this project now was because it seemed like there was a good set of off the shelf tools to help make the archive searchable. And when we started, we had an idea in our heads of some of the technologies that we were hoping would allow us to get as much value out of the photographs as possible. Um, so as an example, um, when we started the technology um, or when we started the project, we thought that object detection might help us identify what is actually going on in the images. And, um, you know, that was one of the technologies that seemed most promising. 
the ability for machine learning to apply terms to the image to identify the location based on landmarks, for example. As we started experimenting with those technologies, what we started running into were some complications um, based on the unique attributes of our archive. So for example, um, here is a photo. This is, um, I think the presentation is lagging a little bit for me, sorry. Um, here's a photo, this is obviously taken in Paris. You've got the Eiffel Tower in the background, um, one of the most distinctive structures in the world. These are probably tourists. And when you start looking at the objects in the photo and classifying the photo, you know, this guy is carrying a camera. They're both wearing coats. This is obviously a city scene. So if I were a photo editor, I would probably want to search for something like tourists, Eiffel Tower, Paris, something like that. So if we run this photo through Google's Vision API, um, this is what it gives us. And there's some pretty cool information here. Um, first of all, it identifies this photo as being in Paris, which is pretty cool. And it picks out the Arc de Triomphe as a landmark. It identifies that the subjects are wearing coats and that this is a photo of an urban area. The thing though is the, the objects and labels that it pulls out aren't necessarily useful as search terms. Um, for, for the most part, the high confidence terms may actually serve to muddy search results. And as we dug into this example, we started to believe that you know, Google may be searching the, the internet to see if it can find this image or an image like it and applying um, you know, some, some of these terms based on that search. And the reason we believe that is because um, in this example, the Arc de Triomphe is not actually visible in the photo, it's what they're standing on. And this is a photo that had been published digitally in the New York Times with a caption indicating that they're standing on the Arc de Triomphe. So that is pretty cool. But for uh, an archive that exists mostly, um, that for the most part has not been published on the internet, it wasn't going to be as helpful. The other problem that we ran into, um, this is a uh, common optical illusion. Is this a duck or a rabbit? And based on the rotation of the image, Google's Vision API returns a different answer. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the problem is that most of our scans, all of our scans actually, do not come in with any rotation metadata. So this is how this image was actually delivered to us, how it was scanned. And without rotating this image, you see we start to lose some of the responses from the Vision API. We no longer get landmark information. We lose a lot of the relevant objects and labels that um, Google had detected. And we start to get some responses that are not very accurate there. Excuse me, things like top, shoe, and room. So we tried automatically determining the correct orientation of the image. Um, unfortunately, that was pretty inconsistent as well. We tried things like horizon detection without too much success. So object recognition wasn't going to be as helpful as we had initially thought. So we looked at facial recognition. Um, the idea that computers can recognize faces from any image has become almost a meme, uh, particularly if you talk to, to people who aren't as familiar with the technology. Here we have uh, John, this is John Lennon and Yoko Ono um, in 1972. It's hard to see Yoko Ono in this picture, but obviously John Lennon is a pretty recognizable face and the sort of person that you would expect that facial recognition might be able to recognize. So first off, a lot of companies shy away from recognizing faces for obvious reasons, privacy for one thing, and there's been, I think, a lot written about um, facial recognition's ability or inability to distinguish between people of color. Um, Google, as an example, uh, that we're looking at here will identify where the faces in a photo are, but it just tells you some attributes about the face. Like, is the person likely to be happy or sad? Are they wearing a hat? It doesn't actually tell you the name of the person. Amazon does have an API, uh, a celebrity recognition API. It doesn't recognize Mr. Lennon here, and you know whether that's because it's an old photo, it's black and white, maybe it's because you know the peace sign that he's flashing is um, obscuring too much of his face. Um, various companies also allow you to provide your own set of human classified images to train a model to recognize a face. That is pretty expensive and time consuming for an archive that spans a few hundred thousand notable people over 100 years. So we decided that that was too expensive. And so finally, we're left with uh, text recognition, the ability to read text from photographs. And so here's that photo from earlier. 
And if we look at the back of this image, you will see um, this image was published in the New York Times. And one of the things that the archivist did when an image was published was to paste or tape the caption as it was published to the back of the print. And so that's what you're seeing here in a brisk wind atop the Arc de Triomphe. If we run the back of this image through text recognition, this is what Google's Vision API recognizes. Um, and I've bolded the caption. You can see it's great. It's perfect even. Um, all of the search terms that we wanted from before are there. We've got Paris, we've got the Eiffel Tower, Taurus, Arc de Triomphe. You've even got the name of the photographer. There's a few dates that the Vision API uh, recognized in text that might be relevant. It's not always that easy though. So here's Amelia Earhart with one of her planes. If we look at the back of this image, we'll see again, there's that caption that's been pasted, but it's been damaged. And as you can see, the Vision API did not do as well with it as it did with the last example. Earhart nor Wheeler Field were recognized from the caption. It didn't pick up Ms. Earhart's name and handwriting and the dates are all wrong. Um, if we look at another example, this is Amelia Earhart again. And we look at the back of that image, there's no caption this time, it's just stamps and handwriting. And you know, I should say we were pretty impressed by what text recognition could read when it came to handwriting. But as you can see here, it did not read Amelia Earhart correctly, it read it as Lamelia Carhart. And there are photos in the archive with even less information than this one. So it became pretty clear that we weren't going to be able to build a good search experience that relied just on information that we got from the images alone, that we were gonna have to, to look further afield. Well, we had a trump card. Our archive was already classified. Um, and that's a pretty great thing because for more than a century, we had librarians clipping and cataloging and categorizing content by topic. And that was always gonna be our best input on forming our search engine. So let's get into it. The first thing we had are folder covers. So remember the folder in which, uh, for example, the Amelia Earhart pictures came from. Um, so folder covers are easy to read, uh, but they have a very broad categorization. So this is pretty easy to tell here that this is this folder is gonna have photos probably of family life for Amelia Earhart. And even though it's handwritten, it's block text. So most of the text recognition APIs and systems are gonna be able to pull this out. The problem though, is it's, it's broad. I mean, there are probably gonna be other photos in here that are not uh, directly connected to this topic and you're gonna have false positives. But we have the card catalog, which as we'll see, can be hard to read, uh, certainly by machines, but it, is, it has rich and granular classification. So here is one of the cards from Amelia Earhart. And uh, as you can see, um, based on what uh, some of our text recognition APIs recognize, it actually pulled out enough of this to make a pretty decent search experience. But even the best text recognition is, is not gonna make it a good experience to read this. You're always gonna wanna read the original text. And Google Books, for example, uh, follows this model where when you search, you search, the OCR text, but when you're looking at the book, you're looking at the original um, document, the images of the original book. Um, and then also your brain, the human brain's program to, to fill in the gaps. So this card, the top of this card is damaged, uh, but the human brain can figure out this is probably Neil Earhart. Uh, but, but one thing that became apparent to us is we still wanted to give our digital users this experience of being able to go through the cards, both for additional context and sometimes it gives you other avenues to explore. So we wanted to have this experience for our users and it needed to be, um, you know, a, not a jarring experience. Things needed to be uniform and straight and as we'll see examples of later, that's not always the case. Uh, one other thing with text recognition is when you have cards that are mostly handwritten, like our earlier example about William Veek, um, you know, the handwritten cards are even harder to read. So you definitely want the original text um, to refer to, and you wanna have a good linear uniform experience as you're scroll, scrolling the cards. So what are some of the, the flaws and defects, if you will, that I was talking about? So here's an example. Some of our cards, actually a lot of our cards came upside down and crooked, and they had this black border around them. Obviously you wouldn't want to scan this. This would be very jarring. 
Uh, but it's easy to figure out and then you can straighten it. Here's another example that's harder to clean. Um, this is, there's obviously an overlap here. And, and so we not only have to get rid of the card underneath it, we also have to go back and make sure that that other card was in our archive, in our digitized archive. Here's another example. It's uh, really quite crooked and a, and a corner is cut off. So uh, I should mention that the crookedness on the upside down, that really affects the quality of the OCR. So you really want uh, text going you know, right to left and top to bottom and, and OCR tends to do a lot better in, in that situation. So this is a recurring theme that we, we ran into with various things. Um, we were constantly cleaning data. Um, you know, we were detecting problems, we were figuring out techniques to clean them, we were validating them, and we'd find something else. And this was an endless quest. And not only with cards, you know, when we were doing uh, text detection on backs of images and folders, uh, you know, orientations, and maybe a specific word stream just to pull out the dates, uh, all of these different things had, you know, this sort of process of detection and cleaning and validating, and it had a very long tail. And in my case, my product manager was Will. And when he's your product manager, he's going to push you as far along to the right as, as is practical and possible. Um, so this was, this was something we we're constantly doing. And we did a lot of things you know, to help us detect. You know, we would send, send up structured information to BigQuery. We'd do the analysis there. We would use Jupyter Notebooks to do analysis. We would clean uh, cards and images with OpenCV and ImageMagic and, and a host of other tools. So this was, while this may seem arduous and tedious, it was really fun actually to do this. Um, so here's, let's walk through an example. So here's a crooked card again. Um, so we wanna straighten this, we wanna get rid of the borders. So how would one do that? Uh, turns out the best way to do that is you wanna detect the corners. And there are a couple of well-known algorithms to do that. There's a Shitomasi algorithm and a Harris detection algorithm, both of which are implemented by OpenCV, the very famous computer vision uh, open source library. So you detect the corners. Um, for the Shitomasi, I should say, you may wanna blur the image first because that leads to better edge detection and hence better corner detection. So once you have the corners, it's easy to determine the angle of rotation just with using basic high school trick. So you know the corners, you have the angle of rotation, you straighten the card, that's great. And so now you still have the coordinates, the straightened coordinates, and you can crop out the part of the image that you want. And then you wind up with something like this. So these were the kinds of problems that we were solving. And you know, as I said, it was, a, it was a really fun experience. So let's talk about another set of problems that we ran into. Problems with OCR text in particular. Um, as we've seen examples, you know, OCR is great, but it's going to have a hard time with white space, with handwritten text, with typewritten characters. Um, and so we had to figure out strategies to cope with those. So here's an example of a card. Um, with typewritten text, we found that um, some of the tools really had a hard time distinguishing between L's and 1's. So here it detected a 1 instead of a L. Um, occasionally, it'll, it would insert white spaces. So here it inserted a space between Afghanistan. And that is a problem because text space is very important uh, as the default sort of, um, strategy in most search engines about you know, separating words and, and tokenizing words and, and so on. So, you know, this, this would cause us problems uh, for a lot of queries. I should also say that we were using Postgres in the beginning uh, for a lot of this um, until we couldn't, you know, we, we started using Elasticsearch after that um, for a variety of reasons, which we're happy to talk to you about. Um, okay, let's see another example here. So this is again, handwritten text. This is about Gerald Barbarg, uh, who's a cellist, uh, but, but we, we got cellists back and obviously that one too. So we needed a, a problem. We needed to think of something to help us with this. And that's where Will came up with a text recognition bake off. So, as Jimman mentioned, you know, we were running into these problems with text recognition and, and we looked at playing around with them by trying to adjust the search engine. But we also started to wonder how other tools would perform um, in, when it came to, to text recognition. And if you have Shimon as an engineering manager, he's gonna make you work really hard to prove that it's worth the effort before we go off and implement a, a different provider. So we set up a test. So we started by hand transcribing hundreds of cards and folder covers and then we ran them through text recognition services from Google and Amazon and two different services from Microsoft. And then we measured the accuracy of the results. So here's the same card from here from Gerald Varberg. 
And the darker the green, the more accurate the text recognition was. You can see the hand transcribed text and the results from each of the different providers. And you can see here that Microsoft's handwriting uh, recognition API was the most accurate here, which doesn't, um, is not a huge surprise because it's considering this is handwriting. But which provider was more accurate really depended on the example. So as I mentioned, you know, we were really impressed by the handwriting that some of these services could read. And you know, this example, for example, I can barely read that. I'm still not sure if that's an O or an A in Hugh Dalberti's name. And you can see here, Google was the most accurate in identifying this, or at least identifying it as, as we read it. And the results are totally different from the other example. So we found out a couple of things. One is that each provider has its own strengths and weaknesses. So the right solution for your project probably depends on the source material. For what we were trying to do, no one provider was a silver bullet. Between handwriting, which can either be surprisingly good or just gibberish when machines try to read it, and typewritten text, which none of our providers seem to do very well with, our best chances of success were when we allowed multiple algorithms to take a crack at it. And when we had multiple results, the chances that we captured everything successfully between all of those providers increased by anywhere from between 35% when you're dealing with typewritten text and 300% when you're dealing with handwriting. So I should mention here, by the way, you know, there have been new products that have come out since the last time we tested this. So your results might vary a little bit. So now we have at least, you know, in uh, altogether some reasonably accurate text off of our index cards. And the big last step in order to put it to use was to structure it so that it can be more easily searched and applied to photo, uh, photos. So let's take an example from before. This is that same uh, index card referencing Jim Buck. And when we start to uh, break it up, what you find is there's a topic, there's a subtopic or a description for that topic. And it tells you where to find those images. In this case, what this card is telling you is that you can find photos of Jim Buck in this other folder, Animals, Dogs, Pets. And this isn't a folder exclusively about Jim Buck. This is a folder about dogs and pets primarily. This is what we would call an indirect reference. So what we would do is basically using the responses from the text recognition software, go through line by line, look at the coordinates of the text, what the services would call bounding boxes to determine what's on each line and to break the cards down into these pieces. And what you get here is folder ID 4645L40. The name of that folder is Animals, Dogs, Pets. And this includes photos of Jim Buck, professional dog walker. So that's easy enough, but the examples quickly get more complicated. So here's another card for, from earlier. This has a ton of references. It has direct references and indirect references and subtopics and references that are both direct references and subtopics for other indirect references. <laughs> and you know, so, so quickly, you, you start to add a lot of complexity to your app. As you start to go through these lines, so for example, uh, that first reference there, you've got Papillon. That's a direct reference to 4645L64. Um, you've got pedigrees. Um, if you want to see photos of pedigrees, you have to go look in the Dodson folder. And then you've got um, at the bottom, you've got that pets, pet shows and miscellaneous reference. That's to uh, folder 4645L40. That's again, a, that's a direct reference. So that's the title of that folder. And from before we have that that folder includes Jim Buck, professional dog walker. And then at the very bottom, you've got this indirect reference. There are more fo photos of pets, pet shows and miscellaneous in this other folder shows 1990. Um, and so, as I said, it gets pretty complex. If you do it wrong, the results can really get disastrous. And so here's an example from an early attempt. Um, this is a folder about koi dogs, but you can see in the tags there, all this text that we applied from the, the card catalog. You've got things like cows, cougars, collies, all kinds of things that aren't actually in that folder. And we, we're pretty successful in, in making the search experience at this point a lot more frustrating for users than helpful. But if you do it right, and once you put all of the pieces, the information we extracted from 
cards, from folders, and from the photos themselves all together, you get a search experience like this. So here we are, we're gonna do a search for Jim Buck. Before this would have taken hours to find these photos, but now you put this search term in, you get the dogs folder. It tells you that Jim Buck is in that folder and you can jump directly to photos in that folder showing Jim Buck professional dog walker. We did a number of other things to try and improve search and just in these images. Right now we're working on date extraction, the ability to determine when a photo is actually from. Um, we played around a lot with the default Elasticsearch settings uh, to try and make sure that, that things uh, returned as expected. We even tried correlating photos from our archive with scans of our newspapers, of our archival newspapers to, to get good information about when things happened. And so finally, I just wanna mention, you know, there's been so much great visual storytelling that we have published as a result of this project. Um, here are some recent examples that our colleagues put together. For example, um, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, we did a photo essay on her life using some photos from the morgue. I love this one of her with the horse. We did an essay on the first New York City Pride March. And these are all photos from the New York Times and from our archive. Uh, this is a great one. Um, this is a, a private investigator from the 90s and we did an essay on all of the different ways that she used to, um, disguises that she used to wear. And when Muhammad Ali died, we did a big special section in the paper memorializing him. Um, so thank you very, very much for coming. The last thing I just wanted to say is the Times is hiring. Um, if you wanna work on fun projects like this, um, feel free to, to browse the job openings that we have or reach out to Shimon and me via our email. Thanks very much. I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, thank you. Uh, so just looking at uh, a couple of the questions that we had here. Um, one of the questions was around, can, can normal people access this information? So right now, unfortunately not. Um, it's not available outside the building. And the reason is because, you know, Shimon mentioned, we saved everything. And that included a lot of things that we don't actually own. So we have to be careful in what we use and what we show outside the building. Um, one of the thing, one of the reasons that we're working on extracting dates from the backs of the images is so that we can more accurately determine whether the Times actually owns the rights to it. And you know, we would love if if someday we're able to open this archive up to everybody else because it, it really is a tremendous archive. Yeah, uh, I see a question here about are we feeding findings back to the providers? Um, initially, when we started doing this. Um, uh, there, we had a, a bit of a partnership with Google and we were definitely talking to them a lot about some of the challenges we were running into. Um, but, the, you know, we haven't, they haven't asked for, uh, none of the providers have really asked for uh, us to feed the data back into them. But I mean, there was some of that back and forth with, with Google in the beginning. Yeah, and I'll also add, you know, the, we hand categorized a very small subset of of the cards and the folder covers. Um, it, it was enough to sort of get a sense of how much more accurate it was to use the other providers, but I don't believe it was actually enough to accurately train a model. And this has been a big problem. Anytime that we've looked at anything that requires training a model, there's just so many, so much variation in the archive over, you know, it's a full century's worth of, of you know, people's individual preferences in terms of how they like to write things and that sort of stuff. And it's just, you know, from a, the perspective of training something, it's it's a real nightmare. Um, I, I'll see the next one. Um, so I think if you're asking about scanners, I think we had a team of, of three scanners um, going through, uh, scanning them at any given time. Um, in terms of engineers, I think we've always had at least a couple of engineers, up to three. Uh, and I think Will was the product manager. And we had an excellent designer who really sort of focused on um, Jenny, I should really call her out, uh, who really sort of made the experience of the search uh, as, as, as high quality as possible. Yeah, um, Dan asks about how do we choose which provider to use for text recognition for each card? That's a good question, Dan. Um, what we did was um, we would 
in our search index, we would use the, all of the text that all the recognizers provide, all, all the uh, providers recognized. And the result of that was we were getting, you know, our best shot across all of them. For the most part, we found if, if a provider recognized something incorrectly, it was closer to gibberish than it was to a real word that was likely to yield an incorrect result. When the user would search for, for example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we would look across all of those providers and then whichever the first uh, provider that actually had that text in that response, that's the one that we would actually display to the user. So we were searching all three and then picking whatever one we thought was most relevant based on, um, on the, the query. Uh, we have a question from Karen about what happens to the original photos. Yes, yeah, we keep them around. Uh, occasionally, there is a workflow where we want to rescan something because the original scan maybe wasn't uh, as high quality as it could be. So we definitely keep them, and, and we're going to keep them forever. I hope. Yeah, and we frequently. The other thing I'll, I'll add to that is there's a lot of markings on the images. You know, the way that we used to. Um, order up an image was you would essentially write on it with a grease pen. So all the scans have those markings on them. A lot of times if we want to reuse that image, we'll go back, we'll see if we can find um, the the negative, we'll see if we can clean off the scan just to get an even cleaner version of that image. Um, yeah. Eugene asked if we came up with this project. Um, we did not. Um, you know, the, the editors knew what a gold mine the morgue was. We, we've been using this for a very, very long time. We stopped putting new images in the morgue um, back in, I think, the early to mid 90s. But we've been using it, you know, almost daily, even since then. And if you go down there, there are still, you know, folders of, um, you know, really wonderful portraits just waiting to be used. Um, so I think, I don't remember who actually came up with the idea for the project first. We, we talked about digitizing this for a long time. We um, had looked at various companies who might be able to do this for us for a cost, for a fee. The problem with that was that any of those would require basically shipping that archive off for a period of time and not having access to it. And so that was a real no-go. And so the team that maintains the archive did sort of a proof of concept showing, hey, we can scan this many photos with this many people in this period of time and it's gonna cost this much money. And so it's actually more cost effective to do it in-house. And then um, and then the technology, I think the, the CTO and one of the SVPs at the time um, got involved to, to help build the idea of building this tool. Um, Shima, do you wanna take the next one? Do you see those questions in the Q&A? Uh, I actually don't see it. Oh. Do you mind reading it to me? I can read it then. Um, so how much manual intervention did we have to do? And were we complete, able to completely scan all the archive? Right. Um, there was, um, I think, so obviously the scanning is pretty manual uh, and then sort of putting them in a, in a directory is, is manual. But once that happens, there is a process that sort of pushes it up to the Google Cloud storage and that sort of kicks off the whole pipeline. I mean, initially when we're building it, as I said, we'd run into flaws and challenges and we'd have to go fix them. Um, but I mean, right now, the development on the system is stopped. Uh, so we expect it to be functioning until the scanning is done. We haven't finished the scanning yet. It's a lot of images to scan. Obviously the pandemic has really put a damper on that. We haven't been scanning anything for the last six or seven months. Uh, but uh, but we the manual interventions, so the answer is there were a lot in the beginning uh, as we ran into problems, but fewer and fewer, and now it's, it's almost fully automated. I mean, it is fully automated, that's the idea. If there's a problem, we'd, and we'd get some kind of error about it and we'd investigate after the fact. Yeah, and we had a really close, um, we were in really close communication with the team that was doing the scanning who would also review the images as they got into the tool. And as much as possible, obviously, we wanted to, to correct any problems programmatically rather than having to devote people time um, either now to correct problems up front or to make, you know, make it if it's going to take longer when you're searching. So. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks very much.